Right. So I'm going to talk about uh, the thing which was, which was just said, which is um, using ideas from non-equilibrium thermodynamics to do deep unsupervised learning. So before I dive into exactly what I did, let me very briefly motivate the problem. And, and um, so as um, probably everyone here is like extremely familiar with, there's recently been like pretty extraordinary techniques with uh, in deep supervised learning. So, so using deep networks in order to solve problems where, where you know what the answer is. Um, and I think there's a, a pretty broad hope that we're gonna be able to achieve um, similar types of results in cases uh, in the unsupervised learning, in case where we don't know what the, the label or what the right answer is beforehand. Um, so this is gonna be useful in cases where the features or labels are unknown. So for instance, maybe you wanna work with novel sensory modalities. So maybe you wanna put um, an ultrasonic emitter and set of uh, microphones on a robot and you want to gather a whole bunch of data as it moves around and you want it to, to learn how to represent the world. Or maybe you have a large data set and you want to understand and discover the structure in it. Um, so for instance, neuroscience data sets are a great, are a great example of this, um, but you don't know what you're looking for until you find it. Um, or maybe you're in a case where labels are extraordinarily expensive. So for instance, maybe you have a whole bunch of, of like breast CT images and um, in order to, to identify whether something in the image is actually cancerous, you need to like remove part of the breast. And, and so getting an accurate label is extremely expensive. And so the most you can do or the more you can do using the, the unlabeled data, the better off you are. And finally, um, unsupervised learning is hopefully very useful in cases where the task is unpredictable, where, where you don't know what you're going to use your representation for or your model for until, until it comes time to do it. Okay, so I'm going to propose a method for addressing this, this unsupervised learning problem. Um, and this method is going to be based on two observations. So observation one, uh, well, so first of all, our goal here is to learn the, the structure of, of some data set or to learn the structure of some, some probability density. And so I want you to imagine um, that the dye in the water represents a probability density, where each dye molecule is like a sample, and the density of dye molecules in a region represents the, the probability density in the training data in, in that region. And we're going to start off with two observations, one of which is that um, diffusion destroys the, the structure in your data set. So um, if you start off with your data distribution and you were to run diffusion for long enough, um, so in this case it would just be like Brownian motion, then you're going to end up with a totally uninformative um, um, totally uninformative distribution. You're just going to end up, in this case, in the uniform distribution. So it's not immediately obvious why this is useful to us. Um, but uh, as a little thought experiment, imagine what you could do if you could reverse time. So if you could start from a uniform distribution and you could somehow run this diffusion um, process backwards, then you would be able to recover your data distribution. You would be able to, to have a generative model of your data, which involves starting from some uninformative distribution and running this process which destroys all the structure in your data backwards until you get your data distribution. And on its face, this seems like a pretty strange idea. Um, like, you can't, you can't get dye to unmix in a liquid any more than, than you can get um, like a glass to, to spontaneously unshatter. Um, but um, it turns out that using machine learning, we can, we can learn the, the um, um, we can learn the Markov process for the, this reverse diffusion process. And the fact that we can do this is based on a second observation about, about diffusion. So here, um, we're going to zoom in on a little part of the liquid. And so here, we have um, a, a video of, of diffusion where we zoomed in. So each little bright spot is a single dye molecule. And 
the great thing about this is that it looks the same forwards and backwards in time. So I'm actually showing you a movie being played forwards, but here, oh, okay, well, I got one, one extra slide, so I was showing you a movie being played backwards, but, but the key idea is that forwards and backwards in time, it looks exactly identical. Um, and that um, if you're running Brownian motion forwards or you're running Gaussian diffusion forwards, then you take a data point and you draw its next location from a small Gaussian centered around its current location. Um, and for um, very small diffusion steps, the functional form for the reverse process is, is identical um, in that um, the reverse trajectory also consists of um, drawing a, a Gaussian um, with, with some mean and some small covariance um, close, close to, to your original data point. And, and so this is gonna be our basic algorithm. We're going to destroy all the structure in our data distribution, um, but we're gonna carefully watch the way in which the, the structure is destroyed. So each, each trajectory where we, we erase the structure in a data point is gonna be a training trajectory for the reverse process. And then we are gonna train a deep supervised network in order to reverse that diffusion process. Um, and this is gonna turn out to be easy because the diffusion process has the same functional form forwards and backwards in time. So um, if we do Gaussian diffusion forwards, then all we have to have this deep supervised network learn is a function which predicts the mean and the covariance, which we already know of each step in the reverse diffusion process. And that'll give us a generative model of the data. So let's start with a little toy data set. So the forward process is we start with some data distribution. In this case, the data lies in a Swiss roll. And we run Gaussian diffusion until we get an uninformative distribution out. In this case, um, we run a Gaussian diffusion process until we just have a Gaussian blob sent to the origin. So our, our process here was we started at our data distribution or our training distribution and we ran a Gaussian diffusion process where each step in a Gaussian diffusion process involved decaying the previous data point slightly towards the origin so that the variance doesn't run away to infinity and then mixing in a small amount of Gaussian noise. And if we do this over and over and over again enough times, then we eventually end up at a noise distribution um, with identity covariance matrix centered at the origin. Okay, so this is our forward process. This is the, the, this is the, the Markov chain or the diffusion process that starts at our data distribution and in some fixed number, um, some fixed large number T of steps turns it into a noise distribution. And so what we're gonna wanna do is we're gonna wanna build our generative model by learning the reversal of this. So we're gonna have a model which starts at the Gaussian noise distribution and where we run a diffusion process um, in, in, uh, for, for the, we run the reverse time diffusion process where the mean and the covariance functions for that reverse time diffusion process are, um, are, are learned functions, um, which we're gonna use a deep network to learn, and where if we choose these functions correctly, then we end up with um, our, our data distribution at, at time zero. So here again is the toy case. So here we've now learned these functions for reverse diffusion. And so if we run our, our reverse diffusion process, then you see we get back the, the Swiss roll distribution. Okay, so how do you train this? Um, I've been saying we train the, the reverse trajectory so it lies on top of the forward trajectory. Um, there's a bunch of algebra, which I'm not going to go into, but the basic um, thing that you end up with is you end up with a KL divergence between the posterior distribution over going one time step in a reverse direction and the um, generative um, or model distribution for that same step. So. Um, the subjective, by the way, can be found by maximizing the lower bound log likelihood. Um, the derivation is similar to, to what you see in, in variational autoencoders, um, although not identical. Um, and the observation is that 
because your forward diffusion process is just the chain of these Gaussian steps, then the distribution of your um, state at time t minus 1, given your state at time 0 and your state at time t, is um, just a Gaussian, because the entire chain condition on x0 is a, is a Gaussian. Um, and similarly, um, since we know that reverse diffusion processes have the same functional form, um, the, the single step in your reverse chain is, is also a Gaussian. So what our challenge becomes then is to um, fit functions to the known means and covariances of, of this sequence of Gaussians. So this basically turns this unsupervised learning problem into like a regression problem where you have a sequence of um, means and covariances as a function of t and you need to fit um, um, a, a regressor to predict the mean and covariance of each of these steps. Um, you can do the similar thing for binomial diffusion, although I'm not going to talk about it here. Um, so OK, uh, how does it work? So one, one, so we're about to apply this to, to um, some natural image data sets. Um, one very common data set that people work with in, in natural images is the dead leaves data set, which is nice because we understand exactly how it was constructed. And it's constructed by taking a bunch of circles and dropping them down on top of each other, um, where you draw the circles from some like power law distribution over, over scales until they completely fill the image. And this is nice because it has many of the things that make uh, real natural images difficult, such as long range structure and occlusion and um, but on the other hand, we know exactly how it was, how it was um, generated. Um, so we're trained using this training data. Um, this is the previous best model on, on this data set, um, actually by that guy right there. Um, I think he has something that, that's now better than this, um, though, though. Um, and though not yet published. Um, and this is what you get from, from our process training in the same data set. Um, so what you just saw there was we started at a Gaussian and we're running a whole bunch of Gaussian diffusion steps until we get a sample from our data distribution. Um, additionally, um, it's cheap under this technique to evaluate uh, probabilities of data points because everything is just a Gaussian and it's very cheap to evaluate the probability of a single Gaussian. Um, you end up being able to cheaply evaluate um, a log probability data set, and not only that, but we, we do very well in terms of log probability on, on the dead leaves data set. Um, something else that is really neat about this approach to generative modeling is that it is quite simple to multiply distributions or compute posterior distributions um, in, in this framework. Um, so, um, and this is something that is um, difficult um, using, using many other techniques. Um, the reason that it is um, simple to do is that the second distribution that you want to multiply by your distribution, multiply your distribution with, just acts as a small perturbation to each step in the diffusion process. Um, so I'm not going to go into the derivation right now, except to say that because your generative model consists of many very small steps, each of which is a very, very sharply peaked Gaussian, the second distribution you want to multiply your distribution by is very smooth compared to each of those steps. So um, you are able to, to analytically um, multiply, multiply by um, an arbitrary function by multiplying it into each of your, your Gaussian diffusion steps. So as a specific example of this, um, here we trained a model on images of bark, um, which, which um, is another naturalistic image, image data set. And um, here we're going to sample from the posterior over the central 100 pixel by 100 pixel region um, conditioned on, on the surround. And um, we're running the same diffusion process, 
And you can observe, first of all, that it's, it's like straightforward to, to sample from a posterior. And second of all, you can observe that it's able to capture some nice aspects of this, such as, for instance, long range edge structure um, when, when confabulating the, the impainting. Um, <clears throat> on an exactly the same thread, you can um, denoise um, once again by sampling from the posterior. So here, there's a whole bunch of images from the CIFAR-10 data set. Um, and here, we've um, corrupted them with a signal noise ratio of 1. And here, we've taken a sample from the posterior distribution over, over the, the um, true, true CIFAR-10 image, given the, the corrupted image. Um, and it does quite well. And you're able to, to, to handle it um, quite, in a quite straightforward fashion. OK, um, so that, that is the, the content of the talk. Um, these are my collaborators. Uh, Eric is at, at Berkeley, and Nero and Surya are, are at Stanford with me. Um, Surya is my advisor. Um, I'd also like to thank the, the um, Ganguly gang at Stanford and the Redwood Center at Berkeley for like, um, endless discussion. Um, OK, 